the holy grail of investing. I'll back up a bit. 2022 was the worst year on in the bond market that we've ever seen. There's so much news, there's so much BS out there that you have to be careful what you listen to. Welcome everybody to today's edition of the Coffee Break Podcast. My name is Zach Graveson and with me is father of one, great husband, the man with the financial plan, <laughs> me Christian up. Fournier. How are we doing, sir? We're doing amazing, Zach. I'm glad we have another traditional coffee break there this morning. It feels good. Yeah, traditional coffee break. We had a few guest podcasts. We had uh, Axel Raymond that was uh, recorded earlier this year. But well, we yeah. finally got to post that. Um, uh, that was cool to see the response we saw there um, uh, for Axel's podcast. We also had Eric Konovalov, who is life coach, author. That was awesome. Um, uh, I had a good time just going through that podcast a second time to re-listen to it, to do the clips and all that, because he dropped a lot of gems. A lot um, of them. And I really hope that people, I, I haven't seen the view count or anything, but... I hope people went to see it because there's a lot of nuggets there and clips that are come out in the next few days. But uh, or I guess by the time this comes out, clips came out last week. So if you haven't seen them, go on our Instagram, fggroup.ca. Um, but yeah, lots of stuff to talk about. We need to catch up. It's been a little while since we last spoke. We had one of these um, uh, original coffee breaks. But to go through the headlines, um, uh, Macy's closes 150 stores, which is about 30% of their brick and mortar. Um, Musk, Elon Musk sues OpenAI's Sam Altman uh, on the basis that OpenAI was supposed to be a nonprofit. And now he says that they are prioritizing profits over the benefits to humanity with their partnership with Microsoft. We'll see if we have time to talk about that. Um, other than that, there's Warren Buffett, one of his protégés, has built her own private equity firm and she's hunting for small companies, um, kind of an alternative to the private equity space, which I thought was really interesting, something that we might dive into. The NASDAQ hit an all-time high this week, um, uh, or last week again, by the time this comes out. And uh, finally, I know that, Chris, you want to talk about, we've mentioned this before, but headlines. Sometimes you see two headlines that are saying two completely different things. Um, uh, we want to dive a little bit more into, uh, should you be listening to the headlines? Yes or no. And then I think we're going to cap it off with, there's a book that you want to talk about this time, mm -hmm. something you've been reading that you want to share with uh, our audience. Uh, before we get into it, if um, uh, first of all, thank you for listening. And we encourage you to like, share, subscribe. I believe we're at 12. We're slowly, you know, getting up there. More we're getting more subscribers. there. Yeah, we appreciate every single one. If you haven't already, please subscribe, like the podcast. It encourages us and um, uh, helps us also spread this podcast to reach more and more people. So, Chris, what do you want to start with? Let's, I'm going to circle back real quick to, the, to actually the beginning. Eric Konovalov. One of the exercises mm. I'm going to be doing, Zach, is his Any Given Tuesday. I love that yeah. concept of just grabbing your pen and paper and writing down that optimal Tuesday. What does your life look like? I mean, we're all working so hard. We have these goals. We have these dreams. We have these ambitions. Sometimes we forget why we're doing all of this for. So if you guys have a chance, go and look at those and uh, listen to that podcast for that. Now, to go into uh, some of those headlines, some of those topics, let's talk about Macy's. So, mm. like you said, they reduced by 30% in their work store. What they're doing is they're reducing the places that are the least profitable to go and invest bigger, name bigger on the ones that are profitable. I mean, as far as a business sense goes, it makes complete sense. It's like that 80-20 rule. We've done it with our business. Mm -hmm. I'm sure if our clients do with their business, when you sit down and you look at the numbers, me, it's it's funny. I'm at around a 30%. About 30% of my income is from, or sorry, 70, 80% of my income is about from 30 clients. I'm sure they're looking at that, and especially that commercial real estate space. It's tough. It's not easy. Um, I think you had even a comment about the the pajamas that uh, you'll, you'll get into at some point. But, man, people are staying home, Zach. I mean, look, I'm here. I go. I, I love going to the office once in a while, but I'm in my home office. I got a fire going on in the background. I can get my coffee whenever I want. When I get hungry, the fridge is right there. People are aren't going 
to the office as much, uh, even online, Amazon. I mean, if I want something, I need a book. I order the book within, what, 24 hours, 48 hours, it's delivered. So that's why these businesses have to change and adapt. And we're seeing it with our clients too. Like me, for example, every time that I, let's say I get a referral, I call a client. Every time that we book the meeting, I always tell them uh, we can do this virtually. You wouldn't have to come over to the office. And before it was something where it's like, oh, you know what? Yeah, that's actually better. Now it's like mm -hmm. a no brainer. No one, there's no one that wants to go somewhere to meet with an advisor, whatever. At first, I think there was just the getting used to everything being virtual because we do deal with difficult topics when we're talking about insurance. We're talking about death, disability, yeah. critical illnesses, things like that, or even you with your clients, you're talking about their retirement, their life savings. But like we talked about in a previous podcast, everybody's getting used to it. But that is ha has to affect places like Macy's where now they're shutting down so many stores. And I mean, even even uh, for example, my girl, she just got, um, you know, got a nice bonus. And you know, I told her, I said, Look, you got to treat yourself, you know, you've mm -hmm. earned this, you got a nice bonus, you got to treat yourself. Don't put it all on, you know, uh, what I'll call like responsible things. You got to treat yourself. But yeah, yeah, she went on a shopping spree, but she didn't go to this town near Montreal. She didn't say like, oh, I'm going to do a shopping spree in downtown Montreal. Mm -hmm. She has, she follows influencers. She knows the brands that she likes. She goes yep. there, she orders them. She could look at all of them. And the brands are getting a lot better too, for the shopping experience for people who are staying at home as well. Um, the thing for me that I have a lot of difficulty with is buying clothes because I, I never know if they really properly fit. Yeah. And, uh, but I guess I just, I don't buy a lot of clothes online. So that's why I'm not used to, I don't know my measurements or anything, but I'm sure people who shop a lot, they don't. they're, uh, they're yeah. good because sometimes a medium for one company is a large for another, but whatever. But all that to say that we are seeing a shift and I don't think it's something that um, uh, we're going back to is, uh, you know, majority of people shopping in person, which I don't know if it's a good thing, but it's just the new reality, the new me, normal, like we love to say during COVID. Let me ask you this, Zach, because I know it's happened to me so many times. Have you ever walked into a store? Huge, huge department store. Okay. You walk in and it's like, how are they still in business? How do they keep <laughs> the lights on? I mean, this is thousands and thousands of square footage and there's three people in here there's a bunch of employees sometimes you can't even find the employees kind of have to holler like is anyone here but it, it's it's alarming and it's just i mean uh, once in a while you go into one of these big brick and mortar stores and it's just it's dead so uh, i mean I'm, i wasn't surprised when i saw that uh, that headline and another thing that contributes to that is people who get jobs now, young people who get jobs, they're used to school virtual. They don't want to yep. go on the floor, full clothes or whatever. Now they're like they, everybody's trying to do what they can to get jobs from home where mm -hmm. they can work from home. And it's starting to be an issue where, you know, obviously won't say any names, but there's people around me or just people tell me of, you know, their cousin or friends of friends or whatever, people don't want to go in person anymore. And they say yeah. that some people who actually claim that they cannot find a job. Well, there's a big difference between not finding a job and not finding the job you want. You know, yeah. they can't find a job because they want it to be work from home. They want it to be, you know, flexible schedule, all these things. There's all these demands now before you get the job that there's a lot of jobs out there, but the people who are willing to go do those jobs aren't going. So that's another mm -hmm. thing that Macy's probably having a, tr a hard time finding young people who want to go work in a store, to go work on a yeah. floor instead of doing something where they could just be at home, make their coffee, go upstairs, come back down. It's a different world, um, uh, totally different world. So. Yeah, that's 30% of all their Macy's stores, um, they're actually closing down. And what they're doing is, uh, in the article they're talking about, is it, is it, I don't want to say the name because I'm probably not going to say the right one, but they have a smaller version. It's not called Macy's, but they have a smaller store that they have, which isn't as much square footage and all that. That's what they're really focusing on. And maybe because... Okay. They only need three po three people on the floor to manage the entire store. Whereas a real Macy's, you go to New York, you go to that big Macy's, you need a big, you need a big staff to manage all of that. 
let alone just keep it clean and looking nice with the clothes folded and whatever. So, um, you know, uh, yeah. So the problem with that too, Zach, it's look, I spent four years in Sherbrooke, right? In Lennoxville. Um, I, I might be dreaming, but wasn't there a Zellers at one point near at the, at the mall? Yeah. When they left, is anyone in there now? I mean, it has to be, but I remember when I was still there, it stayed empty for a long time. I'm not sure as of today, you've been, you've been back in the air. There might be another big brick and more, but if someone like Macy's, especially if they're in a mall, they vacate that space, that's a lot of square footage. They're going to have to start asking themselves, okay, what are we going to do with that? So now it's, unless they own the real estate, okay, they could maybe sell off the asset. But if it's uh, a big REIT, a big commercial real estate firm that owns that, there, that's some significant hit in the cash flows because that was steady cash coming in every single month on that. So it'd be interesting to see. I've seen people that like places that aren't doing very well, converting some places into condominiums. So you used to have like these types of malls yeah. that they're slowly converting. People buy schools out, renovate, switching because they know there's more of a demand for, for space like that. So I'd be curious to see what the people and the 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 real estate owners of these places, what they're going to do to to fill that, that missing gap there. Yeah, I'd be curious to see the amount of like what's going on with strip malls. You yep. know, like it's one thing like you, you have like a tower, which was a bunch of offices or whatever, turn that into condominiums. I could see that. But let's say like like I'm thinking one of the strip malls in uh, in Sherbrooke where I grew up. There used to be a Zellers, then it was a Hart, and now I think it's a Walmart. But you know, Walmart always does well. But I mean, what what's the next step? Like, if these things, if we actually start seeing by mid to end of the 2020s that we start seeing a decline, in people going it physically into the stores and all that, what's going to happen? Are those places all just going to be like storage mm -hmm. to ship out these products, or I don't know, but. Definitely something um, uh, to keep an eye on that I'm curious to see what's the what's going to happen with all commercial real estate, actually. And we yeah. have a conversation with someone, um, I won't say the name yet, but we have a conversation coming up, a podcast with someone who is in real estate. And there's a ton of questions that I have for him. Mm -hmm. um, uh, just commercial real estate, interest rates, everything. I think it's going to be a great talk. He's a great entrepreneur, too. Um, uh, so that'll be, um, uh, that'll be a good podcast coming up. Um, but I want to touch on... The headlines this yep. is something you mentioned you wanted to talk about before the pod, where this kind of started a few podcasts ago, where I mentioned, you know, sometimes you'll see this many thousands of layoffs. Economy is not doing well. After that, you see unemployment's at an all time low. Like you always see headlines where it's like, OK, well, which one should I believe? And then the conversation actually turns into should we even pay attention to all these headlines? Okay. So I'm curious to hear you yes. kind of unwrap that. So quick story. A couple of weeks ago, and I was going to talk about it uh, that week, but we, we decided to, to post the other podcast. So I go to breakfast with one of my investment partners, one of the firms that we work with. And their firm, Zach, they did an actual, they simulated the returns of if someone had invested every single time the New York Times had the worst headline. For example, time to sell, market's going to crash, It's the end is near, uh, you're going to lose all your money, et cetera. The average, don't quote me on this, but if someone would have had bought it every single time that they were saying that, would have been like 14% a year, something incredible. It just goes to show you that, well, one, why do they do it? Because that type of news sells. I mean, these are big, yeah. massive media corporations I'm sure for our podcast, if we titled it, the world's going to end five steps to right now to secure yourself for the end of the world, it have a lot more views and subscribers than we have right now. But why? It's because that <laughs> sensationalism, it sells. Mm. So that was number one. So she tells me that. Then we'll transition to the book because there's a, you'll see there's a link to it. So I got this book by Tony Robbins. It's the, it. the, holy, the holy grail of investing. So I'll, I'll get a little quick comment that my wife said on that there. But even in his book, I'm, last page I read there the other day. So they're talking about, I'll back up a bit. 2022 was the worst year on, 
in the bond market that we've ever seen. Correlation between stocks and bonds, all-time high. So on November 9th, 2021, Bloomberg wrote, the U.S. junk bonds set a record of $432 billion record for sales. Not even a year later, October 22, from Bloomberg again, October 22 of 2022, global junk bond sales dropped most ever with no signs of recovery. So it just goes to show you, man, that there's so much news, there's so much BS out there that you have to be careful what you listen to. So let's talk a bit about the book. Uh, first thing, as we know, Tony Robbins is a life coach. So when my wife saw that, uh, she knows who he is. She's seen his documentary uh, his uh, on Netflix. It's pretty good. I've seen him in person. So it says, well, why are you grabbing financial advice for, for Tony Robbins? I mean, he's not mm. financial advisor. And 100% right. With that said, and he says it in the first pages of the books, it's, why did I write this book? Because I have access. Access mm. to the brightest minds in in the world, when it comes to finance, in the book, he interviews Carl Icahn. He's got access to Ray Dalio. He's personally coached Ray Dalio, who owns the biggest hedge fund in the world. And this third book, this third installment, is all about where the ultra-rich put their money. Okay? This book that you're reading, this new, the Holy Spirit. Exactly. Book, new exactly. Book. Okay. It's where do the ultra-high net worth, the richest people, the smartest people in the game, where do they put their money? And they talk a lot about alternative investments. So it's funny, you told me this morning there, the headline you saw about Warren Buffett's protege kind of doing a spinoff of smaller private equity. Well, private equity is one of those places that a lot of the richest people, they put the, the they buy in. He talks about sports, okay, sports teams. That's the new, that's the new uh, sought after asset for high net worth. If they can own a piece of the, mm. the Boston Red Sox, of, of uh, the, the LA soccer team, of whatever, the Patriots, they're going to do it. Why? Because it's so lucrative. These teams, they have monopolies. Whether you're in a recession or not, people are going to be at those games. So mm. Ray Dalio talks about how do you build that holy grail portfolio. That's what he called the holy grail of investing. And it's all about diversification. And how do you find eight to 12 assets that have a small correlation to each other? People, normal investors, they don't have access to that many investments that they'll react in different ways and in different markets. I mean, you have stocks, you have bonds, we saw last year that debt diversification didn't do anything. The market dropped by 20. The bonds dropped by 15, 20 as well because of inflation. So the, the, these ultra high net worth, they're invested in private equity and private credit. They'll buy out sports teams. They'll buy alternative assets. They'll own real estate infrastructure. So it's extremely interesting. Uh, we've started implementing alternative assets for our clients, Zach. And it's actually done very well. It's another part of the portfolio that we can invest in for, for our clients. So one thing's for sure, the industry is going to be changing quite a bit. There's going to be a lot more uh, access to these types of investments. And now it's to find a way, and that's what he's pushing on big uh, hard. It's because how do someone that isn't an accredited investor that needs a minimum of $100 million net worth, not including the primary residence or 200 k of income a year, how do they get access to these things? And not only that, I mean, once you do, there's like, there's so many people going after it is these big firms are just selling out to the biggest bidder. So it's only the ultra rich. So there's things that are changing. Uh, we're, we're not going to talk about it today, but there's some good stuff that we might be getting access to for our clients there shortly that we're working mm -hmm. on. So, I mean, look, we're, that's why we're always reading Zach. That's why we're always looking at what we have access. Cause we want to make sure that we're always a step ahead for our clients, for our business, for what we can do for the people. And we just have to stay up to date because times are changing. We have to make sure that we're able to grow our clients money for the long term. 
and have a higher expected return. And look, we've seen it with pension funds, Zach. Back in the day, you could have a CPP that could be invested 100% in bonds, and they'll have their 7% target with a very low variation. But nowadays, to be able to hit that 7% a year, you have to have so much more. The alternative asset portion of these big pension funds are up significantly. So uh, no, it's the, the landscape's changing. And uh, so yeah, alternatives, you'll see it's on the rise. And when it comes to headlines and news, just keep buying. I mean, if you've got 20 years ahead of you, it's we. I love looking at the news because I love to to know what's happening, what's going on in the world, to see mm-hmm. where things are going. But if they're telling me all to sell, I'm just, I'm just I'll keep buying at a discount, and I know long term, I'm I'm not smart enough to time the market, so I'll just keep buying it at all times. Last thing before we change topics, because uh, that's a question that pops in my head, but I kind of know the answer through you. But I know it's a it's a question that's going to be very common if people listen to this. <laughs> is going to be, if this is where the ultra rich put their money, how accessible is it for the common man? Okay. So there's a couple things to, there, I won't start sharing names, but there's some big firms right now in Canada, especially that they're making it accessible for the common person. So that's going to help follow up after too. Yeah. So one thing though, it's that these alternative investments, Zach, there is a significant lockup period. Sometimes you can't touch your money for five years. So you have to make sure that works in your plan as well to go and say, look, I mean, look, people do it all the time with the GIC and they're willing to lock it up at one, 2%. When some of these private equity deals, you lock it up, but you're making 15, 20%. I mean, you know, there's a big difference. Yeah. Um, one thing they're looking at in the States Zach, and I think it's going through Congress right now that he was mentioning in the book. It's the whole concept of being an accredited investor. It didn't make sense that, okay, why is it just that the ultra wealthy, or at that point, not even the ultra wealthy, just someone that has a million dollars of net worth, why are they the only ones getting access to the better stuff? Why can't someone that's trying to get there have access to it? Like, you know what? Okay, it's a good point. So they, it seems like they're trying to pass a bill where if someone that isn't yet at an accredited status could take a test to make sure they have the competencies to understand exactly, okay, they understand well, perfect. You can go and invest in these things that you would necessarily be need to be accredited for. One thing that changed in our landscape here in Canada is the access to liquid alternatives, which... Uh, so a liquid alternative is, is an alternative strategy investment, which they can use leverage, yet there's daily liquidity. So if a client needs to sell out, they can sell out and it's traded like a, like a normal fund. So that we've already started implementing for our clients. We have some great partners that have different strategies. And I'll look, I'll share some right now. There's a market neutral strategy that we put in place for, for our clients, which they'll buy a certain basket of stocks. They'll sell a certain basket of stocks. And their correlation to the market is pretty much at zero with a beta of zero. There's some that it's uh, arbitrage. They can do uh, derivatives so they can sell calls and puts to generate income. So there's there's these different types of alternatives. And they've done well for our clients in these past few years, especially with correlation up quite a bit. So it's just, that's a, a first step. And uh, it's just to see how this industry is changing. But we're going to make sure that if there are changes, that we're ready to take those on for uh, for our clients. Now, is this someone who, let's say you have someone who's in their late 20s, early 30s, they found their, you know, the first job is rarely the one that you'll be there long term. But, yeah. you know, after two, three years, once you're done university, you usually found something where you have a better idea of what your path is. Mm-hmm. So someone who has stability financially, and who has started investing, you know, they put their money in their TFSA. Yeah. They're maybe starting to look at buying a, their first property in the next few years. Because that's generally the people who listen to us are 25 to 35. Mm-hmm. Um, is this something that they should be asking their advisor about um, alternatives? Is this something that you should be doing early? Is it something you should be doing when you're really, you've been invested for a while and now you're really looking to di- diversify? Or at what point should you be 
asking questions about alternatives. Okay, good. Asking questions could be as early as now. No matter where you're at, just got to make sure that the person you're talking to, they're aware of what's happening. If you ask them, what about alternatives? Well, what do you mean? Like, they should know. I mean, it's their job to know yeah. what's in the market, what's at, even if it's not for them yet, it's good to know. Then, look, it's once you have your, you're well established, you know, you already have a diversified portfolio, you got all your current needs met, then you want to diversify your assets, start looking at what, what can be offered to you. So that's, that's the way I would attack that. And I mean, look, if you can find, because if you look at, I mean, it's always based on past performance, so it's not forward looking, but private equity has done a phenomenal job. Private credit, I mean, when, when rates were paying 1%, 2%, they were paying 6 7 8 9 Huge difference for pretty much the same risk. So it's just looking at what options there are. I think the landscape's going to change. I think that uh, if there are any business owners listening to this, people that are getting into that alternative space right now, they could have a, quite a monopoly, especially if they find a perfect balance of how to get it to the mass population while being able to keep it on the private. And I think, I think in the book, there's quoting that the private market, uh, no, something crazy is that. Talking about mid-market companies, okay? I don't know if I can find it real quick. If not, I'll just go off of what I remember. Okay. Yeah, right here. The U.S. middle market companies, so that's that market, have up between $100 million and $3 billion in revenue. Okay. And anywhere between 100 and 2,500 employees. You know how many there are of those in the States, Zach? 200,000 companies that fit that criteria. There are 200,000 companies in the United States of America that make between $100 million and $3 billion of revenue. Wow. So they're not considered, they're not either publicly traded, most of the, well, they're all private companies. These private companies, mm -hmm. they need needs. That's why they, there's private equity deals happening, private debt, they borrow it. So the market's huge. And I think so um, the alternatives, sorry, the alternatives is a way for you to um, uh, access these companies through private equity. That's what you're saying. Private equity or private debt. So these buy these baskets, you, you can get the upside on those. And look, there's, they're much smaller than most publicly traded companies. So the upside can be, can be a lot greater on that side. Huge. Is this, how much has the financial, like in terms of investments, how much has the landscape changed in the past, like 10, 20 years versus the, you know, from let's say the seventies to the two thousands and now from the two thousands to 2020. Oh, like how right. much has it, it was alternatives always a conversation, just not accessible. Uh, was it always just stocks and bonds before or how's, how's it evolved? Because it seems like as with everything, things are progressing so much faster mm -hmm. that I'm wondering, is this something that, you know, how, how do people keep track with all this other than obviously having an advisor you trust that is on the ball with all these things? You know, it's funny, Zach, when I started my career, I'd go, uh, go out to lunch a lot with, um, with the gentleman that I bought his book and we'd have these conversations and he talked to me how it was in the, the good old days, but he was telling me at first these, these independents, they were the ones that started, well, selling mutual funds. But just that was tough for people because before that, it was just GICs. People, like, unless you had your broker and you were buying this, these stocks and all that, but, like, man, people were just investing in their in their GICs and it was, that's what they knew, that's what they wanted to do. Yes, rates were higher, but, red, like, lending was higher, but it, because rates were higher, funds were doing better, so... There was even a transition to get to that. And at first, looking at the landscape, there was only a few Canadian funds, international, forget it. Even US, there weren't many. So things have changed so much. They will keep changing. <laughs> Excuse me. I think for the better. <clears throat> but with that said, we'll have to be careful because the more that things come out to the market, there's going to be a bunch of junk too. So the good thing is if you're going to partner with someone that does alternatives, 
make sure they've been doing it for the past 20 years. Because there's been firms that have been doing it for a long, long time. There's going to be new firms coming in and say, oh, yeah, that, this is what we do, our special, but they don't necessarily have the skills or the, the capital to go and get those big deals because like a lot of them, they, they want the big names after it. A great book to, to read, guys, it's uh, by, by Schwarzman there, the one that started uh, the Blackstone. Was it Blackstone or Black? Uh, not Blackrock. Is it Blackstone? The Private Equity. Stephen, yeah. he has a great book. And it talks about how he kind of built the, built the, the, the this um, one of the leading hedge funds there with over a trillion dollars of assets under management, and um, he he was in early. He saw where it was going, and there's a few people that did, and they've they've done extremely. I mean, they're look, when we talk about wealth, Zach, people think all right, athletes, right? They make a lot of money. If you compare them to these financiers, to these it's not even close, man. Where you see and an you athlete, remember, man. yeah, you, you got to remember an athlete will take the NFL. Their average career is three years, so yeah. you could be looking at someone making a million dollars a year, which the average salary is around that. Because we see the big names, the Pat Mahomes, the Lamar Jacksons, and all that, but most of the NFL, you don't know them. You know, a hundred percent about even the, even the starters, the starting O linemen, most people don't know them. So yep. when you look at the average career, three years, average salary, I think I had looked once and it was around like 860,000. If you look at the average me, salary, not the median, median would be way different, but the average. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I did a clip on that, um, uh, last year, but when you look at that, even if it was 2 million, Two million mm -hmm. over three years, you're at six million. We're not even counting taxes, which you're in the highest tax bracket. You're making a lot a year. Well, then after that, even if you had six million, you're what twenty five. You have six million. Your NFL career is over. Look it's at hard. listen to so that. these people. When you're talking about those financiers, them they're yeah. making money. They're making NFL money, but over 30, 35 years. That's a big big difference. Look, Schwarzman. Guess how much he made just last year? And it was 30%. Uh, sorry, this, yeah, last year. And it was 30% less than the year before. How old is this guy? Oh, I think he's in his 70s. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. But just, if you had I'll to guess, he's making the 12 million a year at least. $896 million last year. That he his, made personally or his firm or his? His take home. My God. The gap, it's not even, it's, it's another, it's another world. It's a completely it's other world. world. So you hear up my home, X amount of million dollar deal. It's like mind blowing. Then you see some of these numbers take home, pay close to $900 million in a year. Okay. It's another there's game. Levels. There's, there's levels. There's levels to this. Even at that <laughs> level, there's, there's levels, Zach. The, I mean, we we do pretty well, but there's other levels and there's levels upon levels and it's just, but why? I mean, that's what they're talking about too in this book. It's these firms, Zach. You know how profitable they are? It's because they collect, one, they collect the management fee, 2%. They charge 2% for all the money and they lock it up. So you can't touch your money for 10 years. So what does that mean? Guaranteed cash flows. So they're guaranteed cash flows on 2% for a mm. bunch of money. And not only that, performance fee. They get 20% of all the, the money they make. So they take a $100 million fund, they triple it, they bring it to a billion dollars. They just made $200 million plus the 2%. Like they make a lot of money. So it's just, it's impressive. I'm happy I'm reading the book because it's eye opening too of the whole industry of these things. And there's going to be more and more needs for 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 clients to be able to access these types of investments but it's just it's 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 hard to wrap your head around it sometimes too the amount of money these guys are making and just the different levels of of all this uh all this stuff so yeah so i guess we can kind of conclude that topic by saying that there's people who've been making tons of money for all these years by using these alternative investments but more and more these are becoming accessible to the common man, the me, the you, the Mr. Madame Tout le Monde. Yep. So 
overall great news and i know that's something that you've been working really hard on is to have access to more of these types of funds mm -hmm. types of investments for our clients so um that's great and that's already 35 minutes flew by flew by flew by it, it flew by um uh there's other topics but we'll keep them from another day i like when we keep these short and sweet yeah. um uh I guess uh, we'll say that uh, for those who listen, again, thank you so much for the support. We always appreciate you listening. We hope you enjoyed the last two podcasts where we had some guests. We have more guests coming up and uh, a lot more things from the FG group that are coming up. But if you have someone, an entrepreneur that you know personally, that you believe should have a platform to talk about their stories, talk about how they started the struggle of first begin starting the business and then where they are at right now and what's their vision for the future, let us know. Send us a DM, comment. Um, well, we're really looking for other entrepreneurs to who can inspire others. You know, a lot of people listening right now. There's a lot of uh, a lot of you right now who are on the edge, who maybe just need that extra nudge to actually go all in into their um, uh, dream of building their own business, but don't know where to start. So that's why um, uh, we have this podcast, and that's why we bring people on so that they can share their story and hopefully inspire you in yours. Uh, yeah. On that. Please like, comment, subscribe. Um, uh, we have posts every week on our Instagram, which is at the fgroup.ca. Uh, sorry, no, at fgroup.ca. And uh, on that, Chris, I'll leave you with any final words and we'll wrap it up. The last thing is F1's back, everyone. So have a, if you guys are fans there, I'm going to be excited watching that season. And thanks to, for listening to us. And if ever there's a something that we say in these podcasts that piqued your interest, your curiosity, you want to talk to us about it, reach out, reach out. And one thing we'll be starting to do too it's, uh, with the podcast, sometimes uh, we're going to have a few guests on there in our week following the same type of conversation, not necessarily more of an interview, but just more of what Zach and I are doing, but with another person. So if you know someone that would be interested in being in on it or you think that could add value and just have a good chat with us while we drink our coffee here on our fg coffee break there let us know and we will be glad to have you guys on so that's all i had to say zach all right well we'll wrap it up and i, I just thought of something how funny is it that one of the things that took us the longest to finally do and decide on when we were building uh, fg and associates was the name yeah and i feel like for the podcast I, I don't even know. I think you just mentioned coffee break. Like, all right, yeah, coffee. Yeah, break. coffee break. But <laughs> it's actually been like now. Nah, it's actually been the name. So I just find it funny how long it took us for FG, and then after that, coffee break was just all right. Call the coffee break. But, but yeah. Uh, yeah, sixteen episodes. Thank you for listening, and um, yeah, we will see you next week. Take care. Take care.